नमस्ते वेलकम टू सच कॉन्वर्सेशन मैटर कॉन्वर्सेशन विच रेप्रेजेंट द फ्यूचर वी शुड हैव आई एम योर होस्ट सौरभ नंदा Today's guests are Devishri Rakshit and Som Paul. They are the co-founders of Supercraft. Supercraft is a Web 3.0 native startup working for democratizing uh, more value given to content creators. I know Devishri and Som from 2020. They've had very different career uh, graphs actually. one would not expect that they come from those particular backgrounds if you just look at what supercraft is trying to do today devishri is an uh, is an english literature uh, masters and uh, has worked in the publishing uh, world for more than a decade with brands like amazon uh, publishing before she moved to the tech side of things worked with creator economy and then managed a lot of operations with som uh, in their previous startup uh, called the home screen network Som on the other hand is an engineer from IIT Kanpur uh, worked in computer science uh, a lot in his initial years um, did a lot of research in graphic design in in Switzerland in Europe and then went on to the US to work uh, for a tech company uh, before he decided to <laughs> switch uh, his career uh, pathway and uh, went backpacking discovered filmmaking and uh, actually managed a couple of companies around filmmaking as well in india uh, with a lot of partners from across the world and i hope that's in that sequence <laughs> um i met both of them in 2020 when the pandemic uh, and the lockdown were at their peak when everyone all professionals were trying to understand how to pivot themselves in this really really complex changing world uh, because of the covid-19 pandemic spark dot live which was originally supposed to support um content creators which were making ad films for different businesses uh, now was uh, pivoting itself towards um a lot of consumers who would um consume a lot of uh, content in their regional languages um related to upskilling related to um uh, entertainment and so on so that's how they pivoted it and i was uh, onboarded on spark dot live platform as one of the first certified career consultants that they had since then uh, so many i we have been exchanging a lot of uh, emails and conversations around technology philosophy of technology future of technology and that we're going to discuss all uh, about that and devishri is actually going to help us in understanding how web 3.0 can be used in real life because well it is still uh difficult for a lot of people to digest how um the cryptocurrency world the nft world is actually beneficial for them um today or in the future it's going to be an awesome conversation let's not waste any more time let me invite them over hi devishri hi som how are you hi sarav hi sarav <laughs> well good to have both of you here and uh, i hope you guys had a wonderful uh, puja and uh, now that you're you know done with the festivities you're ready to take charge of your new venture again yes we did not actually get a break during puja we were working full time oh. well that is not <laughs> that is not the best but i think that is what happens in a in a startup world isn't it and talking about that uh, before we actually get into you know what the startup does uh, i would like to know how both of you actually entered this arena and you know what all things have you done in your life which have uh, led you to this point so far because there's nobody else who can describe your careers better than uh, you yourself uh so sort of you know um uh, if i may go first so my career began uh, with an interesting choice when i decided to not study engineering but study literature and um, it has been the best decision that i've actually taken because what that did was that it introduced me to the world of publishing and uh, i got introduced to you know uh, through the world of books i got to work with professors with you know uh, uh, you know politicians with actors sports people a range of people and what happened because of that is that uh, you know i got introduced to so many different uh, fields of of uh, fields of knowledge fields of um, fields of whether it's entertainment um, Uh, from entertainment to education i got such a range of understanding of you know how um, how how life works in a way and that has really prepared me uh, for this new new journey 
And uh, as I was telling you earlier, you know, uh, from publishing, I moved to uh, Amazon. Amazon took over a publishing firm. And uh, Amazon is, of course, a big corporate and it works in a very different way. And it, it, it working in Amazon taught me um, how one can actually scale content and scale the content business. Uh, and then, of course, I made the jump to uh, move to the world of startups. And it interestingly, it coincided uh, with the time of COVID. I, I moved to a startup just before COVID. And uh, right after that, COVID happened. And it was a period of uncertainty. Uh, but I still think that all of these were the best decisions for me. And yeah, and it's been a fantastic journey. What about you, Som? So, um, so my career journey has been very interesting um, uh, for me, especially uh, because I first, you know, I grew up in a small town called Jamshedpur, steel city of India. Um, I was, I would come to Calcutta every once in a while. So that would be my introduction to the big city every once in a while. But I was fascinated by, you know, what sort of, you know, what big cities offer at that time when I was a kid. Um, from, from uh, you know, Jamshedpur, I got into IIT. So I got into IIT Kanpur. And I was in Kanpur, again, another very small town. And, uh, you know, I was essentially part of the student ecosystem of IIT Kanpur. And we did our best. We did festivals. We organized festivals. Uh, we organized competitions. We did all sorts of things at that time. Um, but during the time of IIT, I did something very interesting. We were one of the first batches to do it. We ended up applying, you know, just for internship randomly to universities in India. And nobody had done it before. It was completely a, you know, a, a shot in the dark. And uh, my interest was to actually, you know, see if I could do research with universities outside of India. And, you know, luck would have it, you know, I ended up getting like a call from seven different universities right after that because of the project that I kind of proposed. And I ended up going to uh, the one in Switzerland and I worked under two of the best professors in computer graphics at the time and even now, um, you know, and the one of the best graphics labs in the world. And so, you know, people talk about metaverse right now. People talk about virtual virtual reality right now. But my introduction to virtual reality was back in 1999. And when essentially like, you know, the projects that were running on this lab were virtual boxer, where you had sensors all over you and you could move your hands and fight with a avatar of a, of a character, right? Very game-like environment. My own project was something called Virtual Human Director, which was essentially a three-dimensional world where you had these small little avatars, right? Whatever computer graphics permitted at that time. And you could control that character through pure text. So you could say, walk from point A to point B, say this, right? And and the character would do this. And this was done at a mass scale. And this kind of project was extremely exciting. For like six months, I came back to IIT and I kind of dived into research again for another year. In fact, almost 80% of my time was in the research lab rather than in the classroom. Um, and I published a couple of papers during that time as well. So that's how my career began. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the first time that I kind of saw the potential of, uh, you know, the technology media, because at the end of the end of the day, like, you know, a VR world or a game is a media format in, in a form, right? So this combination of, you know, societal structures developing over media and technology was something that I first got introduced to there. Um, after that, I got, you know, got a job offer at, uh, EFI in US and I went there it was very very deep into like kernel level coding very different from what I had done in my research so I did not really enjoy it for you know and after three years I decided to leave this flash job that I had like so I bought a car I got all that stuff but then I realized that you know what all of that is moot if essentially like you know I don't end up doing what I really want to do which is being closer to closer and closer to the you know user base and audience and so I left. And one of the other things that had really gotten interested, uh, gotten me interested was filmmaking. And I was making these short films with a bunch of other people in the US. And so I wanted to start a film company in India. Uh, so I came back, took off a break for a year, traveled across Southeast Asia and India, and then started a film company. And it was very difficult in the beginning, but ended up making that work after like one and a half, two years. You know, points where I ran out of money, but I ended up making it eventually making it work very well. Um, and that's how I got into this startup called MixerCast, which was a combination of technology, video, and community. 
And that's how my journey into the world of creators began, truly, like back in 2005. That was the time when YouTube was also coming on. And so throughout the next like 15 years, it has been about this dance between technology, uh, hobby filmmaking projects along the side, and writing projects, and a bunch of things, right? And one of the best decisions of my life that, that was to actually leave that job in the US. Because if I hadn't done that, I would have not been able to see all these universes um, that kind of, you know, was offered by these different, you know, sort of professions, right? So, yeah, so, and my entire quest in life has been to try and converse them to one, one discipline where I could combine both my passion and profession and earnings and working with creators all in the same form. And hopefully Supercraft is that. So, yeah, that's my journey. Fabulous. Well, one of the best things, and I was talking to Devashi about it <laughs> right before we started recording as well, is that I'm so glad that Devashi actually did not have to go through engineering to <laughs> do what she really wanted to do, unlike, you know, me. And so I'm clearly you're very interested in engineering, but uh, I was kind of not very interested, but still got through it and so on. Uh, you, uh, uh, I think that is how uh, most genuine uh you know thought processes come across when you actually realize it through experience what you really wanted uh to do and you experimented and you go through it and then understand and in many ways i think um uh, both of you you know kind of epitomize that saying that india may pehle you know first you become an engineer and then you realize what you want to do but debishri was ahead in, in that curve as well so <laughs> that's quite interesting but to, uh, honestly sort of i would not be able to build any company um, <laughs> yeah, right of course because everything is driven by tech so so yeah the, the, that's that's the handicap with not knowing technology true 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 and that's where you know uh, i got to know both of you in uh, 2020 when uh, probably i think uh, everyone across the world was trying to understand what to do now right we are we are pushed into this uh, area in this uh, situation and what to do now and uh, that's when uh, uh, both of you were running the uh, uh, other startup called Spark Live, the home, uh, you know, screen network, and so on. Um, how did that come about to be? Because um, that itself was such a uh, you know pioneering uh, idea in my mind, and a lot of people are trying to do those things. Uh, they're still experimenting with how to uh, you know bring it to scale and uh, probably also make it the next unicorn. Um, so how did that come about to be? And uh, I know that uh, you guys had shared a very interesting story how you transitioned after the pandemic from what Spark.Live was before and what it had become later. So uh, how did that come about to be? You know, the original vision of Home Screen Network was essentially to build a fully, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a wide virtual media studio. Okay. And the idea being that, you know, people from all pin codes of India eventually, but businesses from all pin codes of India would eventually want to create video ads. So Home Screen Network's business model was very simple. We would kind of bring on board filmmakers from across the country and we would kind of talk to businesses from across the country and enable these businesses to create video ads through our network of filmmakers. So we built out this large stringer network uh, of folks who were creative, right? And essentially, like, because I understood filmmaking, I could connect with these individuals and connect with the challenges that they faced on the ground. So on one hand, the filmmakers would not get gigs or jobs as they want, as they could have, right? But the talent is there. It's, it's not that the talent is missing. On the other hand, businesses are struggling to find individuals who could actually create content. For them. Marrying these two was a very, very natural idea for me. And so we kind of started Home Screen Network with that. We raised funding. We raised two rounds of funding, actually. Um, and we built out studios across, like, the three different cities of India. Um, and studios would be there to essentially streamline the content that was coming in from these filmmakers and help polish them so that they became, like, good action. Um, so that was the premise. But then, you know, COVID happened. And during COVID, it was, you know, we had to shut down all the studios. Devashree was there at the time when we saw we kind of ended up shutting down literally to be taking out all our equipment. We did like, you know, there was not even like help available to move the equipment. So we had to like do that ourselves, right? 
Uh, and post COVID, the business transformed. We started asking, how do we make this platform that we have become something which users can use without having a physical shoot or you know production requirement? That's how the EdTech angle came about. Some of these folks we were kind of actually talking to, you know, creators from across the country. Um, we worked with over 10,000 creators during that period um, who were essentially serving like, you know, users from about 1,700 plus villages, towns, and cities and giving them regional language upskilling kind of courses. Um, and this was a phenomenal period when, you know, there was this, you know, time when we were struggling with COVID for three, four months and then this new model took off. And we were doing extremely interesting work in that space, talking to creators from a variety of backgrounds. Um, during that time, it was very interesting because we also realized what typically a creator wants. A lot, lot deeper, you know, in terms of what they want, what they were not getting out of the larger platforms out there. And that was the learning that we had during running of Spotlight. So yeah, that's your story of how the original model pivoted to an edtech model and how we ended up building Hopsky Network and Sparkline after that. And that shows how much uh, flexibility and resilience, you know, there is uh, amongst um, the team that you uh, both are part of now uh, and at that time as well, that, you know, you were able to pivot on something uh, quite different from what you had envisioned earlier because of the uh, availability of tech, uh, which could be easily shaped and molded into what was needed at that particular moment. Um, is is that one of the, uh, you know, futures of how uh, tech companies in India, at least, uh, have to be? Uh, because the needs of the uh, population and the demographic, which is having access to internet on their variety of, uh, you know, devices or uh, different models, uh, their needs are still unknown. Uh, so it's it's uh, probably it's it's almost like you start a company just to do market research and then ultimately <laughs> you create something which will actually work uh, is it is it uh, on those lines that a tech company has to move now so you know the the interesting thing is that there was this quote uh, that somebody gave before internet became prevalent okay um, and you can look it up. It essentially says that the internet would explode like a supernova. Nobody will use it, right? And that was fundamentally what was said before internet came. And so many people, so many thinkers had said that. Over the dec you know decades of internet usage that we have done now, we now know that that was obviously not not the truth. In fact, very very far from it. One of the fundamental premise that I believe in, like as an individual, is that. The only thing that internet does extremely well is connect individuals better and better and better, right? And the more and as the internet progresses, it's just doing a better job of that. Um, the one other thing that it does is that your persona that was there, you know, fully offline pre-internet era to somewhat online in the early days of internet to fully online. Right. So sort of we, you and I have never met, but your digital persona is what I'm talking to right now. Right. This is what we know. This is what we are doing right now. And that is the Internet. That is the power of technology that the world shrinks. It's like a you know global village of sorts. And individuals have their persona, which is a lot more uh, digital now. And the digital persona will be the most important person going forward as the Internet progresses. And these digital personas will connect. What emerges out of that is something that will we will see across in each different geography. It will be different, but this is fundamentally what is happening. Um, there was three. Yeah, so you know, I am talking from a completely different point of view, uh, not from the point of view of someone who has been part of building tech companies because Soom has been part of different tech companies. Uh, for me, the introduction to the internet happened with, of course, Google search, and then with Facebook. Right, which was like 10 years back when, and then uh, it was Alcott first and then Facebook and then Instagram and then Twitter uh, and then TikTok. Uh, so for me, I have seen the transition that I have gone through and I have seen the transition that people around me have gone through in terms of the kind of way we use the internet. 
And, uh, you know, first when the first time we came onto the Internet, uh, the anonymity uh, that was available, like, say, Yahoo chat rooms, all of that was predominant. Right. And that allowed for a kind of uh, proliferation of content and messaging, uh, which sort of uh, uh, which, which sort of got controlled with, say, uh, the identity that you have on a Facebook or a Twitter. And then came the rise of the influencer economy and influencers and, you know, each person. Uh, having more and more of an identity on the internet. And uh, with Web3, I think that pattern is getting solidified with time uh, because uh, what blockchain is doing, and uh, today I was reading this news that, you know, Google is going to allow, uh, like on Google search, you'll be able to get uh, one's Ethereum address, one's balance, all of that. And very soon that is going to happen even with NFT. Suppose the kind of work that we are about to do, say, for example, I have purchased a book uh, because I come from book publishing, I've purchased a book and Pearson is doing that. Pearson Publishing is doing that. A student has purchased a book. It is actually traced on the blockchain that that person has actually bought the book. And uh, when the secondary sales of that book happens, Pearson still makes money. The student can actually make a secondary royalty from it. And that that information gets stored on the blockchain. So as a user, I know who is that person who bought the book. So it is there is a uh, this is an interesting use case. And I think that this kind of usages are going to sort of happen more and more uh, with Web3. Absolutely. I mean, so many important points you guys mentioned. Uh, first, so so when, when you defined, you know, uh, what Internet does, uh, and I completely agree with both those points, uh, it is, you know, just getting phenomenally better at connecting people. Uh, and secondly, it is also creating a separate identity for us, uh, our digital avatar, which, uh, as Devishri, you know, you rightly pointed out, Web 3.0 is uh, very good at solidifying it. Um, what I personally believe uh, also is on top of these things, the internet is able to uh, fasten our iterations of knowledge and wisdom. So it has it has enabled us to uh, you know learn so much more quickly and uh, with so much more specificity that we are able to create very niche uh, services products out of that knowledge. And. Uh, why I'm saying this is because just recently I, I was exploring uh, this uh, almost a documentary reality show on Netflix uh, related to, uh, I think it's called Bling Bling or something like that, uh, wherein they show these two uh, teenagers uh, around, you know, 14 years ago when they were teenagers, they started robbing celebrities in, in Hollywood and Beverly Hills. Uh, and nobody would really, uh, you know, uh, think too much about it because, you know, they were robbing celebrities and nobody had any clue as to who was doing it, what was the most motive apart from just money and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a documentary series about that. And that's when they talk about, uh, you know, the era from 2007 to 2012, which is essentially the era right before Facebook and Instagram started the influencer, uh, you know, entire uh, phenomena, I would say. So that is the time of Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan and, and all these things. Uh, documenting something which happened in a very big way just 14 years ago and then telling that to the entire world is possible today whereas if you look at human civilization 14 years is nothing 14 years is <laughs> is is not even significant but because of the internet and technology now it's possible to learn from it so quickly so that we can compare that phenomena the pre-influencer phenomena with the internet influencer phenomena and learn from both of them and then take that wisdom and create something completely new on on web 3.0 the the uh, you know precursors uh, to those might be uh, something like patreon.com and only fans and so on and so forth uh, but this is exactly uh, what web 3.0 is doing so what my question is and since we've started talking about web 3.0 now is um, do you think uh, yes uh, do you think and how fast do you think these iterations will happen in web 3.0 that we will see newer and newer services coming up because we are able to reflect and see the wisdom uh, of things which just happened so see the um, web 3 is actually you know moves at a breakneck pace right what was true a couple of months ago may not be true anymore and in fact i would argue that some of the models business models that are emerging now um, uh, some of the very very early stage startups 
they are actually doing something which is a bit too futuristic almost um in comparison to where we stand in the world right now right and this is where i think that the, there is a huge gap between the com- understanding of web3 and blockchain amongst the common mass versus what the startup is trying to offer to the user base and this gap is what is causing like problems in terms of them having you know being able to tap into the markets that are out there and stuff right so uh, one of the big things that keep people keep talking about is web3 education it's because they are constantly trying to see how can they educate the masses so that their proposition actually people would end up you know accepting right um so it's it moves at a very fast pace and the most interesting technological advancement of web3 is what is called composability okay so composability what it means is that each pieces building blocks of a technology business are torn apart and in composable future you can literally like a lego block build together a business just by picking the right pieces and mixing them together but you don't really build a product from scratch anymore you just take composable pieces you mix it together and you enable a, start, a company to come through very quickly um this is fantastic i think because the startup ecosystem works like a almost like a you know research lab in itself um every startup if you see it's a seed of an idea that is getting tested um in the market through some capital and then eventually if it works it survives if it doesn't work it dies off and you know and so 90% die and 10% survive but the best 10% survive the ones who have the best mix of product business sense uh, around their product and cap- are able to pull capital are able to capture imagination of the user base right so this is fundamentally the 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 mix that is happening and it, the internet actually is increasingly enabling these kinds of business models to emerge where you just kind of mix and match different kinds of composable patterns into into building blocks into a business in itself so it will happen even faster if that is even if that is possible right so so i think that you know web3 um, the way i see it is that you know uh, the layer 1 blockchains were built like several years ago and then layer 2 was built on top of it and we are i think in the process like our company and several others like us are bu- building something on top of layer 2 if i may call it layer 3 and uh, i'm sure that there will be uh, and we are looking at you know companies who will integrate with us through apis etc which means that there will be layer 4 and layer 5 etc that will be built as we as 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 the sort of progresses um but i think you know it it is one thing to say that technology is going to progress which means it's going to get fine tuned but human behavior has uh, remained constant for the last 2000 years or or you know so the way i think that technology is going to be able to capture the imagination of people and be useful to them is going to be how is is the big challenge of web3 how they are going to actually have these real life use cases for example you know um uh, for example uh, you know the firozabad police station has started using blockchain uh, why because when the complaints when police complaints are raised they don't want any of the police people to actually tamper with that information and uh, it's like it's immutable right it's time stamped it's immutable it's transparent so so these kinds of use cases will come and i feel that you know for example of course school leaving and college leaving certificates so a lot of these technological advancements will be actually catering to real life use cases and sort of seeing how we move from there and it will of course move into social media it will move into art it has already moved into art but i but for me that is the kind of transition that's going to happen and that's going to happen very fast actually uh, because it's already you know we are at layer 3 in like 4 years so i think it will just this transition is going to like layer 10 is going to happen in the next 3 years maybe you know and i would just add here uh, you know a very interesting scenario with me right so i have lost all my school college iit certificates okay that was that they were all in a folder and because i have i have moved houses so many times and moved through cities i ended up just losing them now for me to get that certificate back is going to take months of effort right what iits are trying to do and a bunch of other universities are trying to do is move these certificates these degree certificates to a blockchain because blockchain at the end of the day web3 and blockchain right is a global persistent immutable database that's what you should see it as right and which means that it's a publicly verifiable record keeper it's a place where you can see that i have a certificate from iit and it's verified and stamped by iit itself. 
right? That is what blockchain does, and historically it has not been possible. And it is it has not been possible because that record keeper used to be central companies. That record keeper wasn't a, a public database out there. And fundamentally, what Devashree just said, right, is that that is the shift that is happening now, and that will define the next decade. That a lot of stuff, information, and our purchases, for example, right, which is what Supercraft is enabling, which is that what what we fundamentally are is defined by what we buy, what we own, right? All of that suddenly become a verifiable proof of purchase or proof, a record of the blockchain and visible to everybody else. And by doing this, suddenly the world shifts in a certain sense. No, that that makes complete sense actually and and the way that both of you have explained uh, you know the, the some of the use cases of blockchain and uh, web 3.0 uh, technologies it just seems so organic that this was eventually going to happen anyhow uh, and you know so when you initially started off by talking about uh, the modularity aspect of it which is you know the composable uh, blocks of uh, technology which we can just put together to create whatever we want um, well almost uh, whatever you want and uh, hopefully that will you know uh, become even more better soon um, is very similar to you know what i learned in coding uh, almost uh, 12 14 years ago which was about modularity uh, create separate modules create separate functions so that one can be reused again and again reusability and so on and so forth right and then uh, uh, later on uh, five years down the line that when i learned about apis and started coding on uh, some of the apis uh, then i also understood okay how plugins and you know things can be plugged together from various uh, different uh, technologies so it almost seems like the the uh, eventual has come already and that is what we are moving towards the only difference what i i personally feel now is at that time you had to be a computer science engineer to actually get into all these things and understand probably now it is easier for a lot of other people to enter into it the the other aspect uh, which you know devashi you you pointed out uh, so beautifully was the fact that how um now uh, even uh, people and organizations and institutions um, which traditionally probably did not really uh, consider technology to be an essential need for their operations are using it as an essential need yes we had computers in police stations in the 1980s also but maybe it was not essential for their daily operations but now in order to be an efficient police uh, force or law enforcement agency where you need to be honest and transparent with the public that you're servicing blockchain probably is an essential commodity right and uh, the other thing that you talked about was was the layers it is so beautiful at how uh, and i talk about this a lot with a lot of other people as well about um, how uh, the india stack uh, is is such a beautiful concept wherein you know uh, way back in 2008 um, nanan and his team they started building this huge database of biometrics and then based on them we have improved so many things in our country the kyc of banks which used to take months now happens in a matter of hours nowadays what are some of the challenges with the web 3.0 world um, Devishri, you pointed out uh, that you know it as, as a sensory experience it is only limited to a few senses that we are uh, giving yes uh, what uh, can you elaborate a little bit more around that and what other challenges do you see uh, for before the adoption of web 3.0 technologies uh, see, for me, like to switch from that conversation to something very, very particular to Web3, uh, is that one of the biggest challenges and the transition that is happening currently in 2022 that happened in the middle of 2022 uh, was the shift from, uh, you know, identifying Web3 with cryptocurrency to looking at blockchain as a technology which is independent of crypto and then looking at the actual real life use cases. And our company sort of started at that juncture. And even at the beginning, we were thinking whether, uh, you know, we will uh, like what is the kind of uh, how much of the financial transactions on our platform will happen through crypto or not. A lot of regulations have come around the world. Uh, we saw a lot of people and friends we know who have actually lost money in crypto as well. Right. Only a few when a few people make money, a lot of people actually lose money. Uh, so I think this transition from the association with crypto. Um, and from that to actually moving to real blockchain technology, I think that is the major transition that has happened. And that is for the better. 
uh, even uh, you know NFTs, which were primarily being traded in crypto, now it can be traded in uh, you know regular uh, fiat currencies. And NFTs is not just we are looking at uh, earlier NFT was a lot about art, right? Digital art. Suppose you have a great piece of art, then I purchase it for a huge price, etc. Then I, I I sell it off, etc. It was just about the auctioning. But now a lot of uh, utility um, has been associated with NFTs. For example, this NFT can't just be a digital object. It has to have a real life use case. For example, uh, we have a lot of NFT ticketing, like I can actually attend the event. I can actually read a book. I actually get a product along with an NFT. It's, it could be a piece of clothing. Like there are a lot of luxury brands which are doing NFT drops, which are associated with real life uh, purchases. So, so I think these are the transitions that are going to happen. So, uh, you know, and so, adding to what Devashri said, right, um, some of the most interesting use cases that we are seeing already, right, um, on our platform is that of, you know, individuals bundling together different digital products and offering it gated to a particular community that they have. And they are building their, like really interesting differentiated product offerings for different layers of their community. Some people who are who we call super fans, some could be even micro for communities within that, right, are being offered digital products, which they can actually consume and they own it. The difference, difference fundamentally in Web3 is that ownership is verified, right, which means that when you actually buy something, there is, a, there is a, almost a record that you get and that you can use later if that particular object can be resold. You can use it to actually resell it also. So there is a very interesting kind of set of use cases that are emerging. Um, and this transition is a difficult transition for many to understand. It took us for all, took us almost a year to get into an understanding of what this shift is about, right? And we were deeply entrenched in the world of Web2. And everybody was talking about Web3, blockchain was coming, but we really did not know. And even as a technologist, I had not written or gone into blockchain technology at all for, for until like late last year. And then when I started getting into it, I, I had this aha moment, right? And I was just kind of, you know, sort of a, a, a spark kind of, you know, sort of burst in my head on, on what is the possibility of a hugely public distributed database, right? Which doesn't die, which is like immutable, where you can see a proof of, you know, history. What does it mean for creators? Because fundamentally, you know, what happens is that with this kind of database, you are able to run a verified community better. You are able to build better economic universes around your world. This shift, it took me a while to understand. And this is fundamentally, I think, the challenge for many who are coming into this space right now, um, who need to first understand intrinsically what Web3 is about. Um, it is not about metaverse. It is not about cryptocurrency. All of these are applications of Web3. It is about, uh, it is very simply at the core of it, a decentralized ledger, a public database that is verifiable and immutable. And from that, different use cases will emerge, right? And some of them will survive, some of them will not. Um, we are in Supercraft intrinsically targeting very, very real world use cases. We only work with organizations we, which are actually doing, already doing business. And we work with them to enhance their business and their business model. Um, and their community through, the, through our offering. Um, and so we are not trying to like, you know, disrupt something. We are not, not trying to change finance, um, none of that. We, what we do is very, very entrenched in the real world. And so for, for us to figure out how to make that happen took a while, but we are there now, I think. Perfect. I now want to jump completely into Supercraft. And uh, so please uh, uh, tell us what Supercraft is, what it offers, um, what was the motivation behind it? And then how can a person like me get involved with Supercraft, uh, use some of um, its services? If the Supercraft, see, when we were doing, when we were working with Sparklight, we were working with numerous creators from across the country and some outside of India. And we were working with organizations as well. These organizations had their own community, right? And these communities would be like small, large, sometimes very big. And they would be directly selling digital and physical products to this community, right? Now, imagine a world where a middleman comes into picture where they are controlling the economics of this particular community, right? What happens is that this is the reality today of the creator universe, that very few, you know, sub a very small subset of creators actually end up making 
money from the content or product they create. On top of that, the bigger challenge is that you know they do not know who their own customers are, right? I wrote a book. I wrote a couple of books. I still don't know who bought my book, right? I don't know who my readers are. It was my product. It was my effort. I spent two, three, four years writing this book, but nobody knows. I do not know who they are. You know who knows this though? Amazon, right? Centralized platforms typically, you know, thrive by ownership of this data. Ownership of this particular customer data and the purchase data that has happened on that platform, but it is unfair because because I it was my book, it was a product I created and I sold it, and a certain set of people bought it. If I had access to that community, I could actually use it. I could actually you know directly talk to that community, build a connection with them, and understand who they are, and create newer products along. This use case is what emerged during Spotlight. When we saw all the creators across the country were actually, and the organizations were actually trying their best to figure out how who their customers are, how can they make better products for them? That was the seed of idea of Supercraft. That what if we could build a creator stack, but the creator had control of their economics, creators had control of their content, their community, and could serve them better through that. And this is where you know we offer our platform almost as a SaaS platform. So any creator who has a certain community base wants to build different layers of community around that. By layers of fandom, I can talk about it in deeper data. But each layer, differentiated products can be offered. And there is verifiable proof of that product that, that has been purchased by that community, all on blockchain, right? And by doing this, what typically happens is that the creator, the community, and us, we all three agree that this purchase actually happened. Their payout was actually accurate. Right, the community knows that they actually have bought it and it's with them, and this cannot be de- deleted. If I bought, I bought a shirt today in physical world. I have that shirt. That is my proof. If I bought a digital product, the proof is owned by another platform. That is not fair. I should have that proof that I bought it. Right, and an invoice is not enough for multiple different reasons. We can get it, but yeah, this is fundamentally what we are doing at Supergraph. Um, we are enabling direct to consumer behavior we are essentially treating each individual each creator and each organization as a small and medium sized business who can build their own economics and their con- control their content and their community on their own without the need for a centralized platform at all this of course will have its challenges but um, we are just starting the journey but uh, you know the other thing that i just want to add here uh, with the big platforms whether it's amazon whether it's mintra whether it's um, whether it's uh, instagram so what happens is that uh, creators produce a lot of content for the sake of virality and engagement right and increasingly creators are realizing that that is not how they get customers at the end of the day and uh, so it's so and and then of course they make revenue through ads etc so it's a much more complex process but it is all done through the mediation of this one platform so we are trying to figure out how you know uh, creators can create interesting exclusive content for their community which may or may not be viral in the sense of you know one thing getting like 1 million likes because that those 1 million people are not going to purchase your purchase that piece of content right but on the other hand how can they be driven to actually produce content even if it is if, even if they have 3000 buyers that is that is useful for them right because they they will actually make revenue from it instead of instead of producing say 100 pieces of content with you know 10000 likes and not making any money from it so so that is the change in pattern change in behavior that has already happened a lot offline but how to make that transition online well wow. that that's uh, that makes a lot of sense because uh, you know as i said the the iterations toward uh, content creators getting more insights and data uh, through various platforms has already uh, it was there but you guys are taking it to the next level which is uh, i would say much more uh, transparent and uh, efficient as compared to uh, some other platforms which allow you, uh, content creators to take some uh, return on their content from from the consumers of the content uh, brilliant now uh, the the uh, you know devashi you had uh, you had hinted at the fact that uh, you you were very interested in philosophy and you know that's why you started uh, uh, your education apart from engineering away from engineering uh, which makes a lot of sense and uh, you also mentioned that you know for the past uh, 2000 years the uh, 
behavior patterns of uh, consumers has not really changed so they they behave in a certain way uh, and i completely agree with you um i currently have a mentee uh, who is uh, a budding philosopher and one of the uh, research areas actually the major research area that we are working on right now is how technology has changed uh, human uh, uh, philosophy and uh, when we talk about technology we are we're primarily focusing on the last 400 odd years which is in, you know starting of the industrial revolution and so uh, because that is where major changes have happened uh, in the labor force if you see you know we we work in a certain way we we study education in a certain way because industries required it and then we have lifestyle problems now because we work in a certain way again so how is that impacting us um taking a clue from there what we have observed in our research is that technology always works in kind of a wave format uh, you can take any wave so it goes up and down basically it goes to one area then comes back and then goes back to that area and that wave usually fluctuates between centralization and then decentralization so you know when the internet started it was started by the us military it was very centralized and in control soon they started giving it out to academic institutions which started decentralizing it and more uh, applications started happening so that was web point 1.0 then web 2.0 again now is concentrated uh, so on the other day we were talking about fang or mang companies uh, these five six companies control most of the data on the planet well not on the dark web but <laughs> on the indexed part of the internet and now we are moving towards decentralization of that data using web 3.0 on a layer created on blockchain mostly when is the next centralization according to you guys happening in technology uh, how many years will it take i'm not saying because we none of us are soothsayers and you know uh, <laughs> we cannot predict the future but then where do you see this happening because this wave the frequency is now increasing so centralization decentralization is happening faster than it happened before uh, how do you see that to because you mentioned uh, universities i'll quickly take this answer and then so we can move on from there so you know when um, say in universities education first uh, like the way education happened is that it happened through the university itself and it was in a way a centralized platform right you had to apply to one of the ivy league schools etc and then of course you know i sitting in india i can actually do an online course of the university abroad and there's there was a dissemination outside of the uh, classroom and then of course came the idea of open access right where i can actually without paying any money actually get a lot of information so what and and we are in that position today and i see a lot of academic publishers you know complain to me that you know uh, and for example professors everyone who is who is creating that content that person is not getting remunerated because of so much of open access right so we are just trying to figure out how the person who is the creator actually gets more returns from it they have actually created something unique and something very very valuable and so in a way uh, in a way web2 actually i don't know what you, you would term it but it is sort of democratized it in a way but in a way uh, the creator therefore uh, the user actually got a lot from it but the person who was producing it did not make much from it so this is the time when we are trying to give the power back to the creator in a way so that the person who uses it also see i feel that when i use get something free of the internet versus when i pay a small price or a big price i actually value it more and more so when i pay for a book i actually read it when i see something free on the net you know i read like a little bit of it and i don't take it seriously and uh, i feel that that transition is what we are going to enable from open access we move to a little bit of a centralized system where um, decentralization is decentralization of the blockchain in terms of everyone having access to that information in terms of who has bought what but the creator having more power and sort of more control and and getting better roi so you know i i look at look at the world slightly like you know slightly differently to you know what you had said which is that there is a there is a shift between centralization and decentralization that is happening on that, right so fundamentally that is true what you are saying and in larger platforms especially that is true but what is happening is that the decentralization itself that we are building right now or that the internet is moving towards will remain in the longer run centralization will happen through new technologies that come into 
okay and one of the new technologies that is coming now is metaverse it's not yet ready but potentially let's say two, two three years down the line maybe a little longer but when it does actually become fully mainstream and seamless in how we use it what would happen is that if one central entity controls that metaverse they would be able to know everything you are buying where are, where you are at any point of time who you interact with right where your eye movements are because they do eye tracking if you have physical ailments it's it's too centralized it's like you know almost one entity controlling your entire life and that is the risk that is the risk that you know large metaverse platforms pose to the world that you know while they are super engaging that data that you are generating just by moving your hands or looking at somebody in the metaverse is going to be monetized so advertisements is going to be used in commercial ways and so the question is how will that play out and how will that get decentralized after that it's it's a question that even i don't have answer to it's too far ahead but this is the risk that i see that is coming now with this wave of decentralization that is the centralization risk um you know increasingly great well which brings me to the next next aspect actually and and you know uh, you both are absolutely right about uh, how this might shape up and we can only use uh, you know uh, <laughs> auxiliary verbs like might and maybe because we don't really know how exactly it will shape up because there's more decentralization more democratization so there will be more iterations and uh, more creativity involved um although which brings us to that very contentious and very uh conflict oriented topic and uh, so you and i we have been discussing this for over a year now as how should we use users data uh, what should be the limits how can we protect the user and not you know engage uh, on the dark side i would say uh, primarily a lot of uh, ai leaders and you know academics uh, they they talk about data being managed in four different models right now um one is the chinese model where the state knows everything and it will keep on increasing its power um the other is the gdpr or the eurozone eu model wherein uh, the user has much more access to protect what they want and there is a lot of transparency as to what every website and every application does and uh, then you know there is the a uh, transition based us model where the companies are pushing for more data access whereas the government wants to uh, you know limit it to a large extent and then there is the indian model where the state is using the user data for the welfare uh, because there is no other way to uh, you know make welfare uh, efficient otherwise um, what do you think how how will we manage data in the metaverse and so on in metaverse or in web3 well web 3.0 is is the right term i'm sorry <laughs> thank you um, so so see in in web 3.0 right so i fundamentally believe in the right to privacy right and i i believe that you know individuals should know what they are sharing at any point of time and should have control over that um reason why we are building supergraft fundamentally is that our users and our creators organizations right they intrinsically know what they are sharing what they are doing and they have control over that it is not about us trying to sell their data to a different organization and make money from that right so that is not the business model for us we provide a tool and we take a cut in between but you know the the entry in use of data to actually you know in a way underhanded way to actually make money is something that i fundamentally disagree right and uh and so it it but on the other hand companies make huge businesses out of doing this right so there will always be this push and pull whoever is trying to monetize user data and have done it effectively will tell you that that is the best way to go about it because it leads to large possible revenues on the other hand there are new businesses coming up which are saying that you know user data is private and let's build for the future for that right who who will win who will lose in this game is a question come that comes down to policy i think fundamentally right it's like a it's it is it is where the government should step in and this is what european governments are doing increasingly that they are saying that you know what i have to i should be able to choose whether an app should track me on iphone or not right or any other phone or not right and if you don't comply with that then your app will not be allowed to operate that is fundamentally what it is right and this is how it would operate in real life like if i am walking around somewhere i do not want everybody to see and know where i am walking right and and track me down 
on internet, this cannot happen like that. That if you cannot just enable, enable tracking of an individual to that extent. It will just so the choice of whether to use a platform or not should be on the user. Business models will operate on both sides. Um, you know, because there is obviously money to be made for monetizing user data. I I look at it like just to add one line for me. I think the best way to is that the internet mimics real life and there should be controls like, for example, what data I shared with uh, Facebook or any other platform. But having said that, when I walk into a coffee shop, there are people who actually see me, who know I've been there. I tell my family, I tell my friends, people who see me on the road. And it's not that I have anonymity. Uh, you know, there is a certain com- amount of anonymity, but not absolute anonymity. And I and I don't know if the internet will ever be able to replicate that. As I was mentioning before, the internet is not able to replicate all my five senses. Uh, it's able to do only two. Uh, so we'll just have to do the best we can with, uh, yeah, with, with Web3. There is one very interesting piece of technology that is coming right now, right? Which is that around a user owning their own identity vault. Right. Where what happens is that you control your data right now. What happens is when you sign into, say, Google or Facebook or somewhere and you create a profile there, they own your data. Right. They're sitting as a custodian of your data. But there are new companies that are coming forward now and elements of that we are going to build in Superpower where you essentially own your data. Right. And you can choose whether to give access to somebody else or not from that with that data. So fundamentally, I think that is one of the technological ways to solve this, you know, quagmire, right? This this challenge that we have intrinsically had on online, that I really should have a cryptographically protected vault of my private information. If I choose to make it public, certain aspects of it, with some platform, with a whether I'm you know on a metaverse and I want to choose, I want to you know sort of disclose certain aspects of my profile. I should have the option to do so, but it should not be mandatory for me to do it. But there's, there should be some controls. Yeah, but so, you know, from the other side of it, for anyone interacting with another person, for example, if I post something, if a person is interacting with me and I do not know their identity, that's a problem. Absolutely. No, absolutely. You're right. So the community space, if you're in a community space, at that time, you have to disclose. You cannot remain anonymous at that time. Because when you are in a communal space and you are being, you know, you are, you are, you know, being anonymous, it actually leads to all sorts of behavioral challenges that happens, right? Community behaves, misbehaves. Um, but in your private space, say I am just sitting and actually consuming content. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to share data with a platform which is just giving me content, right? Unnecessarily, all my history, who my father is. You know what my date of birth was, right? I don't want to give all that stuff because I don't. I choose not to give it at that time. But suppose I am in a social platform where I'm actually engaging with the community at that time. Then obviously I have to share it because I cannot remain anonymous in front of other people. This is typically how real life would function. I completely agree with Demonstri on this. That you know, in a coffee shop, I have I cannot remain anonymous. I have to be public. Um, and when I'm walking on the street in the middle of a market, I'm public. But in my private space. When I'm working in my study room, I don't want everybody peering down on what I'm working on at that time, right? So that is what I'm saying, that the difference comes there. The choice should be upon the space and the, and the individual. It has to mimic real life. Perfect. This is such an engaging conversation, uh, you know, and I think we can spend another hour hour just uh, working uh, the intricacies of uh, what is private space and public space in Web 3.0. And I'm pretty sure uh, if there are some lawyers listening to this or law students, they are definitely thinking of their next Web 3.0 startup idea because for regular people like me, it's very difficult to understand where I should share my data and where not. (laughs) So probably they'll come up with some solutions wherein you choose a package that this package will allow you to be anonymous to this particular extent and and you know uh, big companies who are uh, operating in web 3.0 they have to take uh, the one of these services from these law or legal companies wherein then they abide by uh, their laws and allow that kind of anonymity to the user uh, who is accessing that service um, hopefully somebody comes up with that well great uh, guys thank you so much for this engaging conversation uh, it's 
I, I hope we have more of these. Uh, before uh, we conclude, I would love to ask these two small questions from both of you. Um, first is uh, any career advice for somebody who would like to uh, emulate maybe your uh, career paths, although it's it's going to be very difficult or uh, uh, impractical maybe, but uh, what career advice would you give any young person listening to this? Uh, so I feel the one career advice that I want to give people, and this is not just true for careers, but for life, um, is that the willingness to learn. Uh, whether you are at the age of 20, 30, 40, no matter what. I feel that uh, especially, uh, you know, I see a lot of young professionals who come for interviews. And if you ask them, what is your one weakness? They'll say, I have no weakness. And, uh, you know, that really stops one from actually learning uh, delving deeper into things and sort of figuring out because the more hunger you have to sort of learn new things whether it is um, uh, whether it is learning about your career about your life figuring out what you want to do I think this one willingness is the crux of uh, you know a better career and a better life so you know one one concept that exists in European universities is that of the gap year and this is something that I learned when I started you know, left my job in the U.S. and started traveling. The gap year is essentially the time you take out after university to figure out what you want to do with your life. Okay, and this time actually enabled a lot of really, you know, folks who have just come out with a lot of interest to figure out which discipline they want to get into. Fundamentally, you know, I, I did not have a gap year of my own, but by leaving U.S. and backpacking, I actually ended up trying out a variety of things. And that has been my career journey. So the only only career advice I can really give is that, you know, take time out to figure out what discipline you want to get into, what career you want to get into, and do that. Because ultimately, the joy and happiness in life fundamentally comes from, you know, doing what you really, really want to do and really love to do. Something that really ties in with your personality. Because if you try to not, try to do something which doesn't tie, tie with your personality, you will remain unhappy. And this lesson, you know, is has been spoken by many others. It is not my own. It is, you know, um, Michael Kylie Michaeli uh, speaks about flow state, where artists kind of get into this state where they are so immersed in their work that they are unable to, you know, get any other, you know, sort of distraction from outside to not penetrate them at all. This flow state is when they are the happiest. Um, you know, similarly, like, you know, there has been, discuss, you know, books about Ikigai, books about books by F Viktor Frankl on the meaning of life. Um, my only career advice is figure out that career, figure out what is it that you want to do day to day in your life and do that and figure out how to make money doing that. Because by doing so, you will remain the happiest person around. So, uh, Devishri, one sentence, one line which you would like to give to the world, uh, you know, to make the world a better place. Um, you know, this is this is uh, because of my maybe because of my interest in uh, in philosophy. Uh, this is the answer I'll give you. I feel that you know the happiest people are those who lead a life of struggle and a life of dissatisfaction and constantly try to improve oneself. And they are those people who have made history. They constantly try to build better products, better societies, better education systems. Um, and I feel that this, um, this is the one liner for me, that if you are sort of dissatisfied, uh, then sort of figure out what is it that you want to do to make it better for yourself and for the people around you. And that is going to make life better for, for all of us. Um, my only wish for this world is that disciplines which are completely disparate start working together better. For example, technologists work, you know, closely with psychologists. You know, philosophers work better with, uh, you know, people who are running economics, right? So because because a lot of problems happens in the world from people working in their silos. Um, one can build better things in this world and make the world a better place if disciplines just started kind of working together better. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for being here and uh, taking out so much time and explaining things in such a beautiful, uh, articulate manner. Uh, the more we explain about uh, newer technology, the better so that more people can join in 
the movement and uh, maybe start using supercraft as well and best of luck to both of you for supercraft uh, and all the uh, you know future progress that you're going to make thank thank you sarah thanks thanks for inviting us um thank you so much good luck